this is a long sermon. I need to turn it off. <laughs> if your feelings and reactions are anything akin to mine as of late, I would imagine news events have left your head spinning, provided you a free ticket on an emotional roller coaster riding on anger up that first big hill and pulling in after a rush of frustration into a depressing halt. It seems daily we are bombarded with accounts of gun violence, racial injustices, and a political system run amok, resulting in behaviors and outcomes that surely exceed the boundaries of Unitarian Universalist sensibilities. Our culture has been fragmented, leaving something akin to a massive fissure after an earthquake, a chasm of divisions, left and right, black, brown and white, liberal and conservative, Democrat and Republican, religious and atheist, the list is endless. And sorting it out is both confusing and time consuming. Many American citizens are often reduced to cliches, conspiracy theories, and outright lies in an effort to understand their confusion, and often it's easy to dismiss people based on these premises. Let us for a moment consider the words of the Reverend Dr. William Barber from his recent speech at the Democratic National Convention when he says, some issues are not left versus right or liberal versus conservative. They are right versus wrong. He has a point. But communicating with people, especially with those whom we hold opposing views, is a different matter altogether. In these times of social unrest, our seven principles can help us steer the course and keep some focus. Let us consider the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another, and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregation, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, community and justice for all, respect for the interdependent web of ex all existence of which, of which we are a part. I would ask all of you to think for a moment and take a look at the screen. What is the one most important word to you in these principles? Acceptance, that might be a popular choice. Justice, maybe. Perhaps peace for all you old hippies out there. I think I would, repick, I would pick respect. In light of recent events, murder and mayhem, racial injustice everywhere, in an Orwellian political season that has shaken our sensibilities, we must rely upon these principles as a foundation in our search for truth and meaning. Let's reach out to those in our varied communities. Try to harbor some modicum of respect for them and try to find middle ground. We must seek justice, equity, and compassion. Divisiveness does not help. And that gap seems to be widening. I would propose that we see each other as members of the human race first. Of course, we have our limits as humans. We have time limits, 
emotional limits, intellectual limits, and to that end, we construct our comfort zones. That realm of living we consider comfortable, which might be composed of any of the aforementioned binaries, or most likely someplace in between. In a perfect world, we might strive for balance, a place in the middle, but that's ideal and probably not pragmatic. Most of us find ourselves leaning toward one end of the spectrum or the other, and that is where we find and define our own comfort zones. We are confident in this space. We have defined truth. We have secured our faith and values. We are a storehouse of knowledge with facts at our disposal. We're confident in our political leanings. We are confident to the point of indignation. And if you believe the we here is a reference to Unitarians, you're wrong. The we is humanity. Our principles call on us to engage both our brains and our hearts. They call on us to reach out to humanity, all of humanity. If we are to move forward, we're going to need to step outside our defined comfort zone and reach out to those with differing opinions, values, and views. Now, I've been experimenting with this idea a little bit, only to find it's not easy. I approached three people with whom I have differing views on three different topics, resulting in three enlightening and uniquely different conversations about a certain corrupt and lying politician. <laughs> that would be Hillary Rodham Clinton. A reasoned discussion on guns, believe it or not, and a roundabout discussion on racism. My first laboratory was Facebook in the public forum. <laughs> yes. A friend of mine from high school, a friend I haven't seen since high school, I reconnected to on Facebook a few years ago, and we touch base occasionally. Now, anyone connected to any social media understands that we see what we see there bears some real soul-bearing of people, particularly when it comes to religion and politics. So I knew her politics, and I knew her religious leanings, vicariously. But when I saw yet another post on Hillary's life, I couldn't resist. But before going into battle, I opened a couple of other windows on my computer, and I was ready to fire back with facts from all my reliable sourcing. Yes, I knew better, but <laughs> what's a teacher to do? <laughs> and that was my comfort zone for this conversation. Academic, reasoned, and armed and ready. First, I posted polling from three sources which had fact-checked every candidate in the race, both parties. Clinton scored highest in all three polls, in honesty. Well, I was accused of faulty research. So I took that bait 
and asked her for proof. Oh, I could tell from the weight her fingers were running a race on the keyboard. About 10 minutes later, up popped her response. And it referenced just about every talking point and cliche I'd heard in this election cycle, including a diatribe on the liberal media. Her defense was steadfast and unwavering. She could hear it in Hillary's voice. She could see it on her face. The facts did not matter. She was a die-hard fact denier, and I was a die-hard fact depender. The reasoned argument fell on deaf ears. After a few more lively exchanges, the chat turned conciliatory, and we signed off. I've not engaged her since. But I gave this 30-minute exchange a great deal of thought. I had approached the argument with my head. She had approached the argument with her heart. I reasoned my discussion. She felt hers. And while I'd approached this conversation with the idea of respecting her comfort zone, I didn't really. I didn't shame her, but I did manage to back her in a corner on a couple of points, considering it easy to dismiss people who base their arguments on cliches and conspiracy theories. I was not exactly proud, and I was not exactly the ideal Unitarian. While I was certainly polite, I was a bit of a hypocrite as well. Now, I'm pretty certain I did not wholly respect her inherent dignity and worth, nor did I practice an exceeding degree of justice, equity, and compassion in this conversation. I admit my flaws readily, and I will vow to do better next time. And it didn't take me long. I decided to try again, <clears throat> this time <laughs> with a former student on the topic of guns. I have taught Advanced Placement English 11 to high schoolers for 18 years. I have engaged some of the brightest young minds in Arizona. They keep me on my toes and I keep them on theirs. I had taught this young man about 10 years ago, and we stayed in touch on and off. College and the suicide of a close friend changed him as I watched him leave adolescence behind and become a fine young man. We met for breakfast one morning, and after the catch-up and niceties, the conversation turned to guns. We, I told him why I wanted to talk to him, plucked right out of the week's headlines. Well, in the framework of this particular discussion, his comfort zone was libertarian. Mine was liberal. We were respectful and often thought ourselves witty. Now, I was sparring with someone who could make the argument, who could make me think. I was passionate about this issue and wondered if I could keep my adjectives in check. First, we took on the cliches. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. The right blames people, the left blames guns. When both are wrong and illogical because people with guns kill people. Of course, we laughed and made light of people who could not understand this simple concept. We were both, fairly, fair, we were both of us fairly well read up to date on several aspects of the gun debate. 
We talked about guns in the framework of statistics, policy, culture, many different aspects of the debate. We both had cell phones in our hands and we were just running races, finding our little facts and statistics as we talked. By the third cup of coffee, we had agreed on many points, but on the points we disagreed, we did not budge, neither of us. We were having this discussion in light of the most recent headline, Blue Lives Matter. And the discussion turned to law enforcement and guns. It seems we could stand on neutral ground where citizens were concerned, but not law enforcement. He had three policemen in his family. So in the end, we agreed to disagree. Just like my discussion with my old high school friend, neither of us budged in our obstinate obsession of staying in our comfort zones. We had definitely displayed a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And I, found, and I fared a little better on the dignity and worth and justice and equity scorecards. Wait a minute, did I say scorecards? <laughs> what was I doing? These valued principles are not played out on a competitive playing field of argument, nor are they black and white. I had placed them in my comfort zone of defining my relationships with other people only to find myself overthinking them to the point of rationalizing my own behavior. Now I was confused. And then I heard a story on NPR one morning about how to approach people with whom we have strong disagreements. This story centered around a concept called complementary behavior, and it's really quite simple. Be nice to people, and they will be nice back to you. This month's touchstone theme is kindness. And it might just be in kindness that we begin to understand our opponents and begin to understand how we might find some common ground. The idea here is not to win an argument or change a mind, but simply to get past the boundaries that prevent empathetic communication. I tend to be a heady person, like many of my fellow UUs, we approach many discussions with an attitude that everything is an argument, an approach that is often defensive and divisive. Why should we even approach our opponents? Because we are not winning via reason. It dawned on me that it might be easier, or at least more effective, to change move someone's feelings, their heart, as opposed to trying to change their mind. I've had the Black Lives Matter discussion with more than a few people. I've often started, as usual, with a little reasoned discussion. See it up here. If human lives matter, then blacks are humans, therefore black lives matter. That seems simple enough. This, of course, does not address the movement itself, but it seems a solid enough equation, doesn't it? It's called syllogistic logic. And do you think that matters 
to most of my old friends in the rustic and rural Missouri Ozarks. I'm thinking they would probably think I was referring to silly logic, not syllogistic logic. So keeping that in mind, I called an old college friend I hadn't spoken with in a few years, but I knew him to harbor racist ideas in college at least by most people's definition of the word. Well-liked, popular, and personable, we just avoided the topic with him, except me. And even in 1980, we found ourselves disagreeing on civil rights and our ideas of social justice in both the classroom and the keg party. When we graduated in 82, and went our separate ways, and I had little intention of keeping in touch with him. And we didn't until the advent of social media. And he found me on Facebook, and we reconnected through that medium. It wasn't long before his ideas, again, political, religious ideas, began to surface, and I began to see who he had become. We didn't really comment or engage much on stage. I think we both knew that was not safe ground. I didn't want to have a keyboard discussion with him. So I got his phone number and called him. Our lives had certainly changed. While I was throwing open closet doors, pursuing graduate degrees and working on a career, he was getting married, having children, and struggling financially. He grew more conservative, me more liberal. He was surprised to hear from me. I wanted to try to understand his feelings about race, not his thoughts on race, you see. Yes, feelings are tied to thoughts, of course, but I wanted to take a different approach. So I was careful with my words, cautious and kind, not defensive. We caught up on our lives quickly, but it didn't take him long to ask, why did you really call? And I told him. I told him I'd been thinking about some conversations we'd had in college. I began telling him about my foray into Unitarian Universalism now more than 10 years ago and how it had changed my life. I knew that this would interest him because he had become quite a religious person himself. I paused to listen. And I kept the discussion simple on my end, but steered it into current racial issues, then to Black Lives Matter and our church's involvement in the movement, focusing on our incidents with vandalism, eventually catching the suspect. He was silent, and I knew what was coming. But don't you think all lives matter? Blue lives matter? White lives matter? Well, I'm just listening while he explained why he felt this way. Finally, he asked, 
Did I deny all lives matter? Of course not. I knew the syllogistic logic approach was not going to work. <laughs> Nor would an academic discussion of civil rights or history make one bit of difference. If he hadn't taken that away with a college education and 58 years of life, it probably wasn't going to work now. By my definition, he was a racist. But, I discovered in our discussion, we defined racism differently. And I began to understand how both our lives' experiences had shaped our thinking. I let him talk for some time, and I just listened. I listened with intent, respect, and kindness. And it was hard. I heard it all. And I began to understand privilege from a whole new perspective. As he talked, my heart sank. My heart sank because I began to understand his situation. I heard it all. And what I saw on Facebook about him, I began to understand that that was little more than a venue to mark his feelings of anger, frustration, and despair. Feelings he had no idea what to do with. I only understand this now after listening. His life experiences had changed him. My education and life experiences had changed me. In trying to understand his feelings about racism, I had to cross into his comfort zone and temporarily leave mine. Bringing him across into mine was not going to be feasible. I knew that from the onset. It was an uncomfortable and dark place for me. Was it even possible I could relate to someone I considered a racist? Could I respect his inherent worth and dignity? Not until I heard his story. And his story is one of having never left home never left the Ozarks, rarely traveled, and then just out of state, but not region, working a blue-collar job, poverty and despair. Feeling disenfranchised and ignored by the government, he was a person who sees Donald Trump as his savior. I am not excusing racism. I am not attempting to validate it. I'm trying to understand why people feel racist. Is living in the Ozarks an excuse to be a racist? No. Does living in the Ozarks reinforce racism? Maybe. in some pockets, in some churches and institutions. Yes, these tendencies are more prominent in this part of the country, but how much of a role does geography play in this equation? I decided in the end, it doesn't matter because that's me again. 
turning all academic on the topic, as I head back into my comfort zone. My intent in the conversation was not to argue, not to win or lose anything, not to feel accomplished or superior, but to understand, be kind, be respectful. And in listening to someone outside my comfort zone, really listening, that began to happen. I began to understand a little better. The latest book to hit every must-read list, written by a new up-and-coming conservative voice, J.D. Vance, titled Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of a family and a culture in crisis, addresses the attitudes and politics of the people of the Appalachian region in America and why they so vehemently support Donald Trump, among other geographical phenomena. From what I've read and heard, this is my friend's story. Yes, he's still my friend, because friends cross boundaries, geographic, demographic, intellectual and emotional. They leave their comfort zones and hopefully begin to understand one another just a little better. Crossing boundaries, that is just the beginning. We will never be close friends, but we are, I think, better friends. Did I change his mind? I don't think so. Did he change mine? No. But he changed my feelings. I'm not sure if I changed his. In our current cultural and political climate, where feelings seem to be usurping facts, those of us who rely on reason often find ourselves at a loss. Respecting my friend's feelings throughout our conversation proved difficult at best. Let us not equate the word respect with racism, but let us understand how people feel. Let us equate the word respect with kindness. And in doing this, we might find yet another way to live the Unitarian principles. It might be easier to frame a discussion academically, in reason, as an argument, but not taking into account the feelings of others that often define their comfort zones, feelings that often create walls a more reasoned person might not be willing to climb just widens the gap between us a little more. How are we ever to move forward if we are unwilling to reach out to those of differing opinions? Well, we can take many actions against recent horrid events. We can attend rallies, protests, and vigils. We can talk to our kids and families and write to our police departments and politicians. We can be more in tune with our surroundings and keep a diligent eye out for injustices. We can be kind, compassionate, and empathetic. We can rant to the millions on social media. But it's not okay to remain silent. Yet, sometimes, many times, we simply lack the initiative and motivation for what we might consider a confrontation. Empathy lies at the core of living our principles. 
Strive to integrate them holistically into your life without keeping a scorecard. Pay the kindness forward. But most importantly, we must open our mouths. Resist hoisting our petards of righteous and liberal indignation. Step outside our comfort zones and approach people one-on-one -on -one with both kindness and respect. Thank you.